What's up, Instagram? We're still on lockdown. We are still quarantined. I'm here in Virginia, and I know everybody is in different places, hanging with their selves, with their families, doing uh, whatever they can to pass the time and hopefully use it wisely. I'm going to jump right in here with Gary Gennetti, and we're going to just go on the fly here because he's ready to go, and I'm going to add him. Gary, uh, Gary is a fantastic guy and a fantastic writer, and there he is. What's up, man? Hey, Mike. How are you? Good. You look good. Thanks. So do you. You look stylish, as always. Thanks. Turn my volume up here a little bit. Yeah, get um, out. So you, where, where are you? You're in your house. Like, where, where are you in your house? Um, I'm kind of in like a studio space that we have that Brad uh, does work in, does the styling in. Okay, sweet. Yeah. Now, uh, now, Brad, you and Brad have been together how long? Like uh, 40 years? 19 years, yeah. 19 years. That's great. Yeah, um, I know. Yeah, man. I dig you. I dig what you do. I've, Get I've, out. I've been talking to people for the last couple of weeks about kind of following their passion. It seems like a great time to kind of reset. I know I'm resetting my priorities or things that I've kind of realized I've been wasting time doing in, in regular life, having had this time to, you know, chill out and spend time with my family and frankly, just have to get real resourceful to be creative. And so I started doing these things and um, I spoke with a bunch of folks last week. I know that uh, you follow Jenny Johnson. You're a fan of hers. Yeah, I love and, Jenny. Yeah, she's hilarious. And Seth Green uh, was on last week. My my good buddy, Rob Hubel. I'm not sure if you know him. He's a, a comic actor. He's got a show yeah. on, on Netflix. We lived together in New York back in the day. Uh, who else? Chris Frangiola and Adam Ray had Seth MacFarlane on Monday and Craig Robinson last night. Not a nice lineup. Say, yeah, I know. And you're right. You're you're right. Dead smack in the middle of it. You're solid, yeah. dude. We got Patrick Warburton tomorrow. Oh, great. And then, um, and, and then Jay Lee on Friday, who is sort of living everything that I'm talking about, which is taking chances, doing the work and persevering. And, and he's done that. And he's found himself, you know, as a series regular on a hot Yeah, show. I know. Good for him. Um, yeah. So I remember when Jay Lee was the receptionist at Family Guy. Yeah, so do I. Um, so, so yeah, man. So what you know, just briefly, and this isn't here to promote stuff or talk specifically about what great projects you've done and what's coming yeah, up and all good. that. But just to put things in context, you and I met on Family Guy. I think uh, it was the, I think we both started maybe the same day, which was the I second think we week. Did of start, I think we did start the same day. Yeah, I, I think we even rode the elevator together. Like it was. Yeah, we did. I remember. And it was, I guess that would have been 21 years ago 22 Long 22 it was it was late june of 98 and i was yeah. a week late getting to la because i was finishing editing some some short films my brother and i did and um yeah and then you and i met we were in the king of the hill office yeah in century city yeah and uh for for those of you watching king of the hill used to be a cartoon on the <laughs> yeah it was that uh was. Do people know king of the i oh, love your glasses and hair gary thank you who does your hair i do shit <laughs> yeah god. that's my hair god did mine look um, oh i'm getting love thank you uh juku prince george is in the house yeah yes 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 um so yeah so we met on family guy and you know just to, you worked on will and grace after family guy and right. And then I came back to Family Guy after right. the race ended. Right. And back. everything I work on comes back. <laughs> like, you know what? Why not? What else <laughs> runs 22? So um, yeah. And then, you know, your book, you know, I just, I, I love this book. I'll hold it up one time. Uh, do you mind if I cancel? And I love the way on, on your story post, you blocked it out because you probably feel like you've posted it a million times. But, <laughs> well, um, I had to put, so I had to write somewhere. So yeah. that, that spot was available. <laughs> yeah. Um, I read this over the holidays and Gary, I got to tell you, man, and I, I texted you immediately. I, I just you did. Think, I just think it, it's not, it's hard to put into words this book. Get this book. Anybody who's watching, do you mind if I cancel? It is hilarious. It is, it is earnest it is um you know just open it's you you it's just amazing it has so much texture to it and having read this book 
I see so much Stewie. I see, you know, just the way <laughs> Stewie's been written. And, and what I'm saying is your influence on Stewie. And, um, and Brian, I, when I was speaking with Seth the other night, I didn't realize this. He pointed out that you were the guy who kind of thought to really pair up Stewie and Brian. Um, do, you, do you recall that? Do you take credit for that? <laughs> well, that was, that's very generous of Seth. That's super nice. Uh, I recall, yeah, in as much as I loved writing, I, you know, to me, it's kind of like, it, it, it goes to what you, I think, is the heart of what you're saying to this thing of, you know, kind of like be true to yourself, do, do your thing, find mm -hmm. your thing, never try to mimic what somebody else is having success with, you know what I mean? So sure. I remember starting on that show and I felt there were a lot of people that were really good at certain things on that show that I wasn't good with, that, that were not in my wheelhouse. The science fiction elements of Stewie, right. certain, certain, not all, but certain things of kind of maybe some of like the Peter stuff, but not, not all at all. Um, but at the beginning, I gravitated towards Brian and Stewie because I felt I, uh, I had something, it's not that I felt like I had something to bring to them. It was just I saw an opportunity there to kind of play with those characters as I would want to hear them. Do you know what I mean? Sure. And sure. when the show is that new, you know, there's, there's opportunity to kind of put your stamp. It was either write it the way I thought was funny and what I felt I could bring to it or try to copy what everybody yeah. else was doing and not do it as well. Maybe yeah. I would have, I think I would have done it adequately. I could sure. have passed maybe, but it would have never been more than that if I was trying to replicate what other people were doing successfully. So it was kind of more like bringing myself into it. What about myself could maybe be a part of these characters? So just organically, I enjoyed writing them together. It was yeah. kind of something that I, I enjoyed. So maybe it was also yeah it was it was also a, a very creative environment you know as you remember at the beginning of it uh nobody had any, any expectations of it and we were just all trying to amuse each other so yeah. the fact that that became a part of it is um you know is a really nice you know thing yeah and i remember reading you know your drafts and being like holy shit this is fresh this is great this is so much fun and um, and that what you're talking about the people the writers have different strengths you know on the show. yeah when we came in there are people that are great you know there's always the people that can lay out a good story and come up with clever twists and and things like that and then there are joke people there are character people and you know you're you you just created this relationship which is just so great and Seth and I were talking the other night about surrounding yourself you know once you get to a level. When you're starting, you're by yourself, and then you got your buddies, and you, you, you're making things, and then, geez, look where he is. He's got you know a thousand a thousand people working right. for him on his various projects. But you surround yourself with with great people that have individual talents, and that just takes you to the the stride. I agree. I um, agree. Yeah, it's one of the you know my favorite things about Family Guy, and it's why I've still gone in and out of it for you know 20 years but the people that are there people like you people like alec you know there are so i mean there's so many people there viner and you know i mean there's too many to to list but people that would come up with something in a room that i would never come up with you know what sure. i mean it's like that's what right. you want i don't want anybody who's going to say either the obvious thing the thing that somebody will eventually get to, you know, the expression in the writer's room is like somebody would have unearthed that gold eventually, you know, yeah. and those jokes are great too. A joke that you sure. need enough people in a room, they'll find it. But the one, the things that people come out with that I would never in a million years think of, like the way that you do Bruce and that you kind of, that character evolved, it's, <laughs> it, it's something that I, I love so much. I think it's so funny. And I would have never come up with that. Right. You know, even his turns of phrase and, and the, the pathos you give all your characters, which wow. I've told you before, I think, which is a part of the reason why we connect in some way. And maybe in, the out, in, a, in a different world, we might not have met. Do you know what I mean? It's, of it's, course. It's nice that you get this kind of thing, but, and then you discover, oh, I have a connection. Because you always give all your characters, even Herbert, you know, there's this real humanity 
that they yeah. have and that you you do as a as a vocal performer but as, as also as a writer that i respond to that i that yeah. i love because I, I to be able to do that on top of making something really fucking funny but mm -hmm. to give it you know something underneath and then an animation i i think that's kind of the goal yeah well thanks gary um you know what it is you know i, I think too and I, I i don't know why or if it is even true i was talking with a musician friend of mine Two weeks ago, Dave Schools is in the band Widespread Panic, which is a big jam tour band, and they're they're amazing, and he's 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 crushed it. But you know, I feel like we're almost sort of I don't know. It might sound too precious, but if if it's jazz or what, but it's people doing their thing. You know, each of us is doing our thing in the writers' room, and they just it all just sort of melds into something spectacular that never would have happened if it was just one person doing it. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Yeah, yeah. completely. Yeah, cool. it's, it takes so many, you know, people to kind of, and I, you want people who are really good too. Yeah. Oh, they I'm, make uh, you better. I'm talking with my good friend, Gary Gennetti, who I uh, met 22 years ago at Family Guy. Thank you, and, John. Um, <laughs> John, my Instagram is brilliant. That's nice. That's nice. It yeah. is It is brilliant. I want to get to that in a second. But um, so, you know, so again, so what I'm doing is I've done a bunch of college talks and I speak to young people about just following their passion. And, you know, it's it's kind of a corny thing, but I always say follow that voice inside you along a path to a place that doesn't exist until you get there. So just find your way, do your thing every day toward what feels right to you. And I feel like a lot of people do that. And I feel like more people don't do that and, and ignore what they really want to do and just do sort of what's easier or what they feel stuck doing. So I'm trying to, especially during this quarantine, again, I think it's a time of sort of recalibration. I, I would love to have people just use this time to feel, you know, the, the world is so unpredictable. You don't know what's going to happen. I would love it if people would just be true to themselves because it, it's so great and i i was a young man doing a job that i didn't like i was in advertising right out of college and then i just it was just burning inside me i gotta go do do something funny and so i just completely left everything and moved to california and did stand up and improv and things like that and was broke i worked at the gap i waited tables um speak speak to that some in in your book and you know i don't typically keep referencing somebody's piece of work, but yours is so relevant to this because it's about your journey, all these wonderful yeah. anecdotes. Like you, you waited tables, you, you were a bellman, you, um, I like that you had excursions in Europe, you, you had, you know, you- Yeah, I was a bicycle tour groups. leader. Yeah. Um, talk, you know, talk about when you found your passion. When did you realize you were funny and just wanted to perform? And, and what sacrifices did you make to just pursue that? Too, too much, too much of a question? No, I mean, I never thought of myself as funny either. It's not something that I, when I wanted to be a writer, I never thought, I just thought of myself more as somebody who had kind of an attitude or maybe a kind of, but I never thought, I was funny. I didn't think I wasn't funny, but I didn't think I was, I didn't think like that. And I, I always wanted to be a writer, um, like, which is in my book I talk about. I wanted to be a writer, but I didn't write. You know, I went to school for <laughs> it, you know, when you write in school, but I was nothing prepared me after I got out of college. You know, I'm from a very middle class background. So going to college was a big thing of being able to afford it. And I had to work the whole time. I worked from the time I was 16 to pay for it and to get out, but there was nothing. So that was like a goal, you know, in and of itself. So once I got out, I didn't really know what it meant, how to legitimately pursue what I wanted to pursue. And, you know, there was no internet, so I couldn't really look anything up. So I started taking, you know, survival jobs, like everybody does, those kind of jobs. And then they just kind of took over my 20s. And I didn't know how to get out of it. You know, I didn't know how to actually pursue what I wanted to pursue. Um, and I think, you know, I talk about it a lot in the book, like mm -hmm. this, this idea of what I was in my head and then the it's reality so, of what, I, just what I actually was. I just have to interject. There's so much Stewie in your mindset <laughs> of just like, tricking yourself and going <laughs> off on these fantasies when you first meet someone yes, and then you come back. Oh my God, every job was like, I thought I had to figure it out, right? Like I work at the Paramount Hotel in New York in the 90s. 
And um, I'm like, oh my God, this is my way in. Yeah. So I'll work there. All I have to do was like put myself in the right spot. Somebody's mm -hmm. gonna come up to me. They're gonna be like, excuse me. I'll be like, yes, me. They're like, yeah. Have you ever been on a soap opera before? Like, <laughs> I haven't, no. Would you be interested? I'm like, I guess, you know, <laughs> the sense that you had to be a passive participant, you're like somebody else will know and somebody right. will find me, like I'll be discovered or whatever it is. But this notion that I didn't have to go out and get it, like I didn't know what that meant. So I kept making the same mistakes, like I'll work here, like I'll do right. this and then it will appear. And then, so this kind of keeps repeating itself. But the real truth is, and I, you think you're doing something, but I was afraid, you know, I was afraid I wasn't going to be good at the thing I told myself that I was. Yeah. And then what would that mean? <laughs> you know, like, what would yeah. the truth be of that? And yes. it's, it's like, it's like you're insecure when you're young too. Nobody told me it's fucking okay. You got to learn, just get over it. Yeah. You don't have to out of the gate, be like amazing and be great at it, but just start doing it and, and learn what it means to actually be a writer. Yes. You don't have to do these things, but it was all riddled by fantasy and fear and this stuff. But and all these jobs and then, you know, and you're young. And then at the same time, I think it was in the book, you know, I came out in college. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of, for a lot of gay, well, I can only talk for me, but when you come out later, you also missed a lot of your life. I didn't like have normal fun. You know, right. like, I didn't go out to clubs and dancing or date. Like I didn't do anything normal until yeah. I was in my twenties. So a part of that too is like, you're, you're in the city, you're young, you have a job and you're going out and that kind of becomes your job. And you think you're, having this life, you know, yes. that you think you're having. So it's this weird moment that I had actually in the book that did, does happen. I'm a bellman for longer than I intend to be. I'm 28. Right. And I start to wreck, I can't lie to myself really anymore. I start becoming uh, like, uh, you know, I was, I have, I'm really shitty to these people at the hotel. I do something that totally I'm ashamed of. It's just so petty. And I had to look at myself for the front. I had to really look. I was just yeah. like, this is, this, is your, this is what you are, you know? Yeah. Like, I basically mugged people for a tip, you know? Right. I'm pushing 30. I haven't right. written anything. I haven't done anything. Like, who, like, it was kind of like, a, who the, what the fuck are you doing with yeah. your life? What are you doing? Yeah. And yeah. I switched my thinking around in like a day. I was like, you're waiting for your life. to. You're waiting for some, something to come to you. You have to go to it. You yes. have to go to it. Yes. And within a year of that, I don't say this in the book, but within a year of that, I literally changed everything. I moved to LA. I started mm -hmm. writing. Mm -hmm. I figured it all out. I went to the Writers Guild Library. I was like, fuck it. Fuck it. You know, yeah. I'm doing this and I'm not stopping. Like, no, this is my... I, I could see that this was the time. And if I didn't do it, if I was afraid, right. I'd still be... And not that there's anything wrong with it. Whatever people <clears throat> choose to do in their life, I... I I've done every job and I would do them again if I had to, but I'd still be working in a hotel. And I did, that's not what I wanted, you know? Right. That's not what I, what I wanted to do. It wasn't like you're saying, but you know, your passion, finding that thing. Yeah. I just, I forced myself to just figure it out. It was just like a shift of thinking. It was like, I was like expecting the world to work in a different way. And I can recognize it in other people when I see it because I used to be it. And sometimes yes. I see it, it's more common among young people because yeah. you don't fucking know anything when you're 20, yeah. you know? It's yeah. just like the way it goes. You're not supposed to, you have to learn it. Exactly. But I sometimes will also see it in somebody in their forties or something. It'll be like, you know, oh, I was yeah. going to be a TV writer too, but you know what? No way. I decided no way. Yeah. I do that. Like, it lies in, I'm like, okay, great. You know? Yeah. But it's this sense of like, you can sense when somebody hasn't quite come to that reckoning with themselves that it's like, you gotta, everybody's fucking scared. Everybody's insecure. Everybody's afraid they're a fraud. And so what? And you're going to fail. So what? I failed so many times. And it's yeah. like, and I keep going. And th those are the things that you need to do. And no, ma no matter what it is that you're following, what it is, whatever it is you want to do, it takes an enormous amount of work. So you right. might as well pick something that you're, you really want to do. So you had that, you, you knew what you really wanted to do. You just had no yeah, realistic I had no, way of going about it. Right. I, had, I didn't know what it even meant. Right. I, like, I didn't know what it meant. Like, I never, 
like nobody had even said to me, the kind of writing you do, the ear you have for dialogue, you might be suited to TV writing. This might be a way to do that. Had you considered this, read this book, see this class, you know, I also probably wouldn't have been ready to hear it at a young age, because yeah. I would have been hearing somebody saying, oh, you, you're not a good enough to be a novelist or, you know, right. something stupid. Right. Because, uh, you, you know. You know what's interesting, Gary? I think you and I both or, or neither had someone telling us, you know, giving us a reality check. You know, there wasn't anybody, you know, it, it sounds like during that time up until your late 20s, you you had this notion of what you want to do, but no one was really kind of saying, hey, here's what you need to do. You know, like there, there's none of that. And I think part of, you know, what you have in this book is a lot of that. Young people reading this book are going to be so much better off than or more equipped or more aware than you were at their age. Yeah, I mean, I and, hope. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's I think that's kind of why I'm doing this. And I've been, you know, speaking at schools, I taught a class at um, USC the other day via Zoom. And I just want people to just, you know, you got to go for it. You got to go for it. So um, the fear, there's, there's a thousand reasons not to do that thing, you know, yep. inside you. It's that fear, man, I'm too far down this road. People will think I'm crazy yeah. trying to do mm -hmm. this. I, you know, I can't, you know, whatever it is. I have a dog. I have, you know, it's like stupid uh -huh. shit. It's, there's no reason, you know, to not do it. And you just have to decide to do it. And another thing is, I think, and I, or I believe that everything plays out as it should. You needed to learn all the things that you learned oh, completely. while you were, quote, wasting that time, which, yeah. um, you know, I, I spoke the other night. I waited tables at the Daily Grill in Brentwood. And I would, you know, back in, early on, I had really so far to go before I could realize any of my comedic dreams or, or aspirations and I just remember standing out on a break one night just realizing I, I really just had this profound feeling that I'm doing everything that I can right now and the universe and, and it's taking so long because the universe has to line up for me it's all going to come together at some point I need to just stay my course and trust that the right thing is going to happen at the right time and you know had, had you had your epiphanies earlier, you might be on a completely different path that would have not been as authentic as, as what you're living now. Yeah, I think also it depends. I, personally, for me, I, don't, I wouldn't have been ready. If I moved to L.A. when I was 22 and was like, I'm going to be a TV writer. Yeah. And then somebody hired me as a PA and they were like, you need to get 17 cups of coffee. That's all different. And everybody's going to be a fucking monster to you if you get one thing wrong. Yeah. And this, you're going to be in this hell for 16 hours a day. I would have lasted a week. Yeah. And I would have been like, fuck them. Yeah. L.A. sucks. And I would have come home and I because I would have been... I don't know if I would have had this, I, I would have been secure enough in who I was. And plus I wouldn't have had that life experience that I had, but it's like, I did all my shit jobs in, in New York. When I moved to LA, I was really lucky. And I got a writing job a few months after I moved because when I, when I focus on something, it's like, yeah. I don't do anything. I don't like doing anything half-assed. Every job that I had, I worked really hard. Even when I was sucked at it, I was still committed, you know, to doing it but yeah if i had come at the wrong time it would have yeah. played out completely different because i didn't have yeah. the tools a different 20 year old would have been had great and would have succeeded it and would have known but i didn't have the tools yet i think i was too insecure to, to i was too afraid that what if i wasn't what if i wasn't good yeah and, I, that, and the, the the idea that i would be ashamed and i was a fraud all those negative voices that you hear i don't think i would have had the the fortitude to have pushed through it i think i needed to go through things in the in my timeline you have to. The, the, the way that that it happened but that's what i tell young people i can see when young people can't take criticism well not even just young people anybody but sometimes you can see it if you're if you're giving criticism to somebody if i read something i'm very honest you know yes. even, i'm not cruel but i'm just direct yeah and yeah. a lot of times people don't want to hear it it doesn't mean i'm right but i think you know, you can tell when somebody is just like, well, that happened to me. And no, uh, well, somebody else liked it and thought it was funny. It's like, oh, God, you're completely closed off yes. from the idea that what you're doing could be better. And that's a problem. Everything yeah. I write now, and I've been doing it, you know, for 25, however many years, I, I want everything I write to be better than the thing before it. That's my only goal. Sure. I don't 
I don't reach it necessarily, but my goal is every Family Guy script I've written over the course of 20 years, every time I sat down to one, my thought was like, I want this to be the best one I've ever written of it. Yeah. I, want, I want to be better at, at this. Like that, that's, that's what I try to keep in my head all the time and divorce myself from everything else, you know, all the business aspects of it. It's sure. just like, I want to be better. Like, you know, I want to keep getting better at it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I only, I wrote four or five Family Guys. And I remember the first one was just atrocious. And I'd never written anything longer than f a five minute sketch. Yeah, it's a, it's um, a hard thing to do, too. And the first one just got completely rewritten. And the second one was a little better. And then like the last one that I wrote hardly got touched, you know? And so, yes, I agree with that 100%. And you're gonna learn, you're gonna get better anyway, just by doing it. But right, having a obviously, mindset yeah, totally. is, is uh, completely is that, that in and of itself, it's that, it's that Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours. The I've, more you do it, I the better you that. get. I, you know? I had been on, on my comedy run for eight years when Seth called with Family Guy doing all kinds of different things related to comedy. And I did the math when I read the outliers and I was like, holy shit, I was right at about 10,000 hours when I yeah. landed in that writer's room. So, you know, that yeah. worked out well. And, and again, oh, yeah. like to, to, to the point earlier of just not being ready sooner, it wouldn't have happened, you know? Um, it, would, it, it wouldn't have gone as well. So, yeah. it, and, and one thing that you touched on a minute ago is that fear of, of going for what you really want. It's like dating somebody that you don't really like because you're afraid to go for it for that person you really like. Yeah, because that's if you actually fail, a good it won't, analogy. It won't, it won't hurt as bad. You know, like you, you won't have your soul bared to the world. Right. So, but you, you absolutely just have to go for it. And the, the purest form of that I see is people doing stand up. You know, just literally just standing there, you know, just I, know, I could never do that. Here I am, laugh or don't. And, and you yeah, just have to, you just kind of have to realize that we're all going to die. And like, we what, definitely realize what, that now. <laughs> what, the, what the fuck else are you going to do? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, so yeah, so, so let, let's talk a little bit about um, your Instagram, which is just blown up, you know, little, little one day king george who is uh he's got so much he's got so much stewy um sensibility i you know the, the the beautiful thing about stewy and you're a huge part of this is his surprise take on whatever you know like you ex you cannot you don't know what stewie's take on something is going to be what one example and i don't know who wrote the line but when brian was smoking pot and stewie just hey you druggy you know, just like took the extreme anti-drug, you know, like there's, there's, <laughs> I know. and you're, you're doing, not that you're mimicking Stewie, but you, you have very funny takes on this little fella. And how did that come about? I know that you spent some time um, over there working and did, and were you just exposed to the British tabloids all the time and started thinking about it or? No, yeah. not at all. I mean, okay. I, I did, I, I did a show there for a couple of years, but, but this came. Gary, uh, some for people that aren't familiar with it, to, in a, in a few words, what explain what it is, and and you should follow uh, Gary Gennetti because his Instagram is hilarious. It's just uh, like it's the world seen through the eyes of Prince George. So I've just I turned him into kind of this you know just petty little yeah. insecure, nasty kind of, but hope hopefully also a little vulnerable bitch, and. Uh, so it's the world through his eyes and his take on the royal family and, and all those people. So, no, I just started doing it. But again, it, it, it goes to kind of what you're saying and what this whole thing that you're doing is, you know, I started on Instagram just kind of dicking around, just trying to amuse myself. I had no, you know, idea of, you know, anything of like anything becoming a thing on it, nor did I have any desire for that. Right. But um, I, I did a, I, I was working on a project that was a failed project that was a creatively a terrible experience, a lot of cooks in the kitchen, I felt like it was just a horrible. And the idea that with Instagram, it's just me and my audience, right? I can just put out what I think is funny. And then it goes to the audience. There's nobody in the middle of it. You were the developing audience, a, you, know. you were developing a project and too many people got involved. Yeah, and, and I, was extremely just, frustrating. I was so unhappy creatively that I just turned to Instagram as a way to creatively express myself with nobody in no the middle. Yeah. And I saw these photos of Prince George on his first day of school. This is now over two years ago and he was super expressive so i didn't even know i was doing memes i just gave him an attitude to match his expression right and then 
it eventually, and I did it, you know, like only a couple of times. But then when Meghan Markle was going to marry Prince Harry, my mm -hmm. first thought was, oh, George won't like this. You know, right. he, he won't like that somebody else is in the spotlight and right. taking the spotlight off of him. So I kind of did like a mashup of the, them side by side and, you know, with George saying something um, nasty. And it like, suddenly it started Exploded. taking off. Yeah. And I started expanding how I thought of it. And I started treating it as a TV show. I was like, well, this is a TV show I'm doing. I don't have to tell anybody that's what I'm doing. But I started thinking of it as, as a TV show and every post is kind of an episode and I have different kinds of episodes. And I started playing with the form. I'm like, you yeah. know, well, sometimes when you restrict yourself, right? When you have two hands tied behind your back, you have to be very creative in order to be able to, to do what it is you want to do when you have limited means, certain amount of pictures, certain amount of, you know, ways that you could use Instagram to kind of sell a joke or a story. So it was kind of like a game. And it just, it, it was a thing that just slowly kept building and building and building. So I kept expanding the world right. and how I could use the form. So creatively, you know, it ended up being just something I did on my phone, but it was, it was a really satisfying that's hilarious know, yeah. as satisfying as anything else I've, I've ever done when you remove you know everything else from the equation it being on tv network studios money <laughs> right, all, right all of those yeah. things and um it was just me you know getting my thing out into the world and right. um and now it's an animated show which i'm actually and i'm i'm the voice of george and i'm writing it from home now because right. fortunately animation can still continue to go on because everybody can do it, you know, remotely. Yep. So I've been writing the episodes um, here. Yeah, and where, where, where are we gonna see this? What, what's... On, H on HBO Max, which is the new HBO streaming service. Sure. And when, when's this, oh, it starts in May? No, the streaming service the starts service. In next month, but it'll be on, I don't know yet. You know, animation takes so long, so. Yeah, uh, yeah, cool. Um, so who, who else is working on that with you? Who would other? Can you talk about it? Yeah, well, Orlando Bloom is playing Prince Harry. He's Wonderful. Prince Harry and uh, Ioan Rayon, who was on um, Game of Thrones. Are, are you, your microphone's a little poppy. I know. Ioan, that's how you say his name. Oh, there you go. Rayon. He's Welsh, and that's how you pronounce his name. But he he was Ramsey Bolton on Game of Thrones, and he's okay. Prince William. Great. And uh, Alan Cumming plays George's butler, and Francis de la Tour from Harry Potter is the queen. There's a lot of fabulous uh, people on it. So. That's great. I can't yeah. wait to check that out. Yeah, it's been, um, it's been a lot of fun. So it was a, the way it came about was totally unexpected. And it's, it's super, you know, again, but it goes to your thing. I was following what it was that I felt passionately about, what yes. excited me, what I enjoyed writing. I think when you enjoy something, it, you know, it, it comes out. It come, people can somehow see it somehow. They respond you yeah. know to it as well opposed it's, it's to... you being it's you being authentic and it's you know it's it's ricky gervais making the original office it's yes, uh, totally. uh yeah. phoebe waller bridge it's, it's it's you know it's the people that are just you can tell there's just pretty much one person driving you know they have help but it's a singular it's, vision and it, it doesn't get muddy and it's yeah a family guy frankly so i push that thing through at the beginning big time yeah so, yeah, I, I learned a lot from Seth at the beginning of Family Guy. Too. Yeah. You know, he and was so young at the time and he was so self-assured. It was just he had a very clear idea for what he wanted to do. And yeah. it didn't matter if somebody else didn't agree or didn't understand why it was funny or for a variety of reasons didn't get it. But he had a real clear idea and he always wanted to do the things that he loved that brought yeah. him joy, that he responded to, that was his, you know, thing. And it was very, and fortunately, you know, we also, I think we have a lot of overlap, you know, we had a lot of overlap with the same things. Yeah. And, which is, you know, obviously why we stayed a part of the show for, you know, so long. But that was something that I never, that I took with me, you know, just from, I was like, huh, because I'm older than Seth. Um, but I was very much like, he's right. <laughs> like, yeah. He's right. Like, oh, yeah. he should be fighting for this stuff because he's right. This right. is different. This is, this is unique. And, and he did it. And, you know, when I met Seth, he was at, at the Rhode Island School of Design with my brother. And that's how I met him. Yeah, I remember. Him. And, and he was, um, you know, his, his senior film project was called Life of Larry. And it was basically a little presentation for Family Guy. And so, you know, he did it. He didn't just have the idea. He did it. And yeah. I've talked this week about how back in the day I would just make these short 
you know, commercial parodies. I would take the time to get the guy with the camera and the actress and the editing guys. And, and you know, we would just, I would just do it. I would just do it. And it's the same thing you did with your Instagram. You just did it. It's just you putting this out and, you know, you were, you're extremely lucky to just be able to do that on your own. Are you doing all the Photoshopping stuff too? Or are you, I have you got... somebody who does the Photoshopping. <laughs> I, I thought maybe people. you did. I have two writers who work on the show with me now. One used to be my assistant and his writing partner has done my Photoshop from the beginning. Oh, and he, he's actually gotten extraordinarily good at it. Right. If, you, if you go back to when we first started doing it, right. I was like, it's good enough. It's, right. That's the joke. You're selling no, the idea. He, yeah. It needs to be like, it needs to look really fucking good to sell that joke. Yes. And he's gotten tremendously good at it. Yeah. So I can't take credit for that. Um, so Did Gary know, have a hairstylist come over? Ginger, no, Gary didn't have a hairstylist come over. But thank you. You nuts. <laughs> Gary, everybody thinks you're beautiful, man. You're, there's That's a million my... <laughs> things popping up here. Um, so, uh, so you've struggled. You've conquered you've you know you, you're staying true to what you love to do right yeah so yeah that's, that's pretty sweet and yeah, um, i know i remember when i set out when i left virginia when i was 24 there were a lot of people that were like all right man go give this a shot we'll see you see you in a year or two and, yeah I, I you know there's a lot of people that will say nay and you know, again, I'm just trying to talk to people. I know a lot of people that are watching this and, and that are fans of yours. And, you know, I just think it's cool to hear not just the achievements, but the mindset and the struggles and the fortitude and the and the keep going of it all. Yeah, I think you. So, oh, Dexter's reading my book now. Thank you, Dexter. I think it's also people sometimes, you know, social media can also be a weird thing. It's a, it's a good thing in many ways, the way we can do this now and it's connecting us to have this actual talk we've never had before. Yeah. But it also can give you a false idea of what people's lives are and it, that, that it's e things are easier than they are. It's like, no. I, I've been hustling for, for actually my whole life, but as a writer, I've been hustling for 25 years. You know, I'm like, I'm always trying to, you know, keep myself engaged and, um, working and loving what I'm doing and constantly, you know, and it's hard work. And I think sometimes people get, get, have this um, mistaken idea that it's easy once you're doing it or then, or you know everybody. So it's, it's like, I fucking, you know, I'm still around because I've worked hard <laughs> and yeah. you work. And it's like at the beginning when I first moved to LA and you're talking about myself, so like, I didn't talk about it. Once I decided I was going to do this and I moved here, I didn't even tell, I, I was like, I'm not talking about it. I'm right. just going to do it. I am just doing it. I'll talk about it when I get a job as a writer. That's right. when I'll tell people what I've done. It's like, I can't talk about it. I can't have these fake conversations. Well, this is my plan and this is what I'm going to do and not actually writing and knowing inside, you know, I was just like, just do it. It's so, yeah. it's very, you know, it's like you have to fucking work hard and you have to do it. You yes, have yeah. to do it. And know that other people are doing it. People who you might like or you see what you deem to be successful or certainly having success in something you're interested in. Know that it's like, it's hard. And when you want to write and you can't think of what to write and you spend a whole day torturing yourself, know that every single writer does that, no matter who they are. They totally. all are fucking, I've been writing today and it's been hell. It's like yeah. the most miserable day because it's just like a, an empty page. It's such a fucking nightmare. But it's like that for everybody. And I didn't know that at the beginning. It's like yeah. I had this idea that it was easier for other people or, or it was like, it was harder for me somehow because nobody ever told me, but it was like, it was, I, I always feel like when I started knowing that other people had similar feelings, I was like, oh, thank God, I yeah. can keep doing this. If I know every time I sit down to write a script, I'm still like, how, how is this gonna turn out? Yeah. You're like, What's this gonna be? How is this gonna be funny? You know, oh. fuck, I've really screwed myself now by people thinking I'm funny because now I have to be, you know, it's this weird. Yes. Thing. Yeah. We, there's so much trust involved. And, you know, I think it's it's, you know, it's trusting yourself. It's trusting that things will open up for you if you start doing it. And I think as far as the 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 dicks out there that are kind of anonymously or you know sitting behind a keyboard and, and trying to tear people down or tabloids for that matter or whatever, I think there's a lot of people who 
are just resentful because they're not doing their thing. And so it's much easier to sit back and eat McDonald's and yell at, you know, somebody it's for definitely. Great. And, <laughs> and and athletes too. I mean, do you think Michael Jordan didn't fucking work harder than anyone else on the planet for when Nick he was there? Just, and it's, and Nick it's just said, thank you. I'm trying to write and I get frustrated too. It's okay, Nick. Yeah, <laughs> it's fine. Like yeah. I'm literally, should be I was I was writing right before I came out of course the one thing that I wrote all day was the 10 minutes before I hopped on the phone with you I was like ah something something right. came out I know and, and people will always also weirdly try to make you no matter what you whatever success you have I mean my biggest thing was like I want to get something on TV I want to write you know have my name on TV and then I will have then I will have done it and of course, that's just, <laughs> that's just the beginning. Me, but it's like, and then there'll me, be people. Nina's, de, de, Nina's Gianna, uh, me watching and eating McDonald's, I feel attacked. I'm, <laughs> no, I'm I like kidding. McDonald's. It's okay. You're yes, allowed. I'm, I'm kidding. You're welcome, I'm kidding. Nick. But it's you're easy. Allowed. That's all I'm saying is McDonald's is easy, you know, but don't always eat there. So you don't always eat there. Sorry, but Gary. It is, it, it is that thing where people will always think, and then you finally get a job, right? I, I remember when I was on. Will and Grace was like, oh, you're on Will and Grace. And then the show gets canceled. It's like, oh, what oh, are you going to yeah. do now? Or you're nominated for, the show's nominated for an Emmy. You think, oh my God, I fucking used to clean apartments and I'm nominated for an Emmy. But you don't win in it. And, you, and it's suddenly like you buy into like, oh, you lost, you're a loser. You know, it's right. like all these weird <laughs> kind of things. And you just always have to be divorce yourself from all the other shit and, and just be like, why did you, why are you doing this thing that you're doing? You, 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 you should be doing it because it was certainly if you're if it's a creative endeavor because you have something to say right what is it you want to you want to say yes. you yeah. know and and work on on that everything else will take care of itself don't yes. worry about that i once met with a writer and the first thing he asked me was how much money you make for a script he was like out of college and i was like you're not going to make it i yeah. knew i was like I, I mean maybe i could be wrong i'm i'm rarely wrong about stuff like that and this was 10 years ago and i haven't heard of him but it was like how much money do you get for a script i'm like if that's your first fucking question you know how i found out how much money you get from a script after i wrote one like yes. when i was on the exactly. show and Me i too. was like oh my god yeah <laughs> like, that's so cool yeah. i didn't know but in other words you have to be doing it for the reason like like it's cuz it's going to be so much work and you, you have to, to have, it, have it inside you. You, know, you have to have something you, you want to communicate and get out. And, and that needs to be the priority. And how do you get better at that? And yes. who, do you, who do you like? And who, whose work do you like? And right. who do you want to be like? Or who do you, how do you be yourself and still learn from other people whose works you like, whether or not they're Seth or Ricky Gervais or yeah. Phoebe Waller-Bridge or whoever it is, these people with these incredibly strong, um, terrific voices. And then how do you learn from that and, and take from that and have that enhance your work and all? Those are the ways that you should be, things that enrich you, right? That, that make you better. That, that's one of the gifts of being in these writer's room when other people are making you better and you're like, oh, yeah. you pitch something that's I, half there and I somebody came... else gives you the other half of it and together you've got this great bit. And it's like, that's the shit that's super satisfying to me, you know? Yes, yes. I, um, I saw some James Cameron quote of all people, but it said, uh, figure out what you want to say and say it in a way that only you can. So that's I think that, that's the truth. That's a pretty good one. Well, obviously, and, he would, uh, you know, he, that's what he does, you know, but it is, it's, it's, it's the truth and, and truth. And it's certainly, it's like, it's basic shit. A lot of it too. It's like, how do you, how do you be yourself? How do you be authentic? Be, have your own voice and learn who and what to listen to. It's like, learn how to be better. Learn, learn how to take a note and learn how, how not to listen do, to something, you know, <clears throat> no. Do you meditate or anything, Gary? Do you like? I don't meditate. You know, no. do you, what do you, so you, uh, do you obviously you work out and stuff. So is that sort of where you just kind of let things settle? Because some people meditate, some people pray, some people. Yeah, know, the gym is, is where I let things settle. Even on Family Guy, when we were working those hours at the beginning of the show, our hours were, you know, were very long. And I think we could be there for 14 hours. Yeah, we days. were there a lot. And I would always go to the gym every morning before because I needed one thing where I was like, that was mine and that had, that was completely separate from what we were going to be doing. If I was going to be in that room 18 hours, I still was going to have that hour so that I could be, that I, not only did I control it, but it was like a separate thing. You know, I wasn't using my, my head. I didn't Correct. have to think about anything and yeah. I could keep myself, you know, so moving. That was your meditation. That's when you could yeah, that, so that was my. Thoughts. That has served as my therapy, you know. It's like it's like whatever 
you know, you get that works, you know, right. for you. I've also been good at remove, you know, when I'm not working to just turn it off. I don't become obsessed. Like I can go away for a week and be like, just read a book and be lie on the beach and eat and drink wine yeah. and, and be totally like shut off. And, Do, you know, so what is your, me. what is your regimen? Do you, um, it, I think you're the kind of guy that sits down to write. And I think you referenced that earlier. You know, I did the morning pages way back when, which is get up in the morning and just write three pages longhand on a notebook and put it in an envelope and do that every day for six weeks. And then you realize day one was all about how you had to go to the bathroom and the coffee tasted good. And by the end of it, you have written a complete outline story about whatever yeah. it is. Do you, do you just sit and write? Do you set aside writing time? Yeah, I think that that's actually, that's great advice. I'm skeptical, not skeptical is the wrong word. Sometimes I feel though that that stuff doesn't quite work for everybody. So mm -hmm. it's easy. If, if it doesn't fit you, you can be like, Ugh, I'm never going to be able to do that. That's not my thing. I don't write longhand. I, I like to always work, you know, right. on the computer. So I wouldn't write longhand so on you a pad. Can, so you can edit. Writing is yeah. terrible. But I, I need to kind of open up the whole day for myself. Like literally knowing I had to talk to you, I was like, okay, this comes at five. So because I need to, even if I only write, I give myself a goal of what I'll write in the day and I give myself the whole day to write it. As much I free up, I try not to even make plans. Well, now we don't have to make plans, so it's, it's not <laughs> super helpful. But, you know, so I, I can just be like, this is the only thing that I need to kind of keep in my head and I'll, I'll give myself the luxury of a, a bit of space to get in on it. But I think sometimes with writing, I had this kind of precious idea of it when I first started doing it. It was very like... Um, like in the first year, like when you write a script, like like I was some in some fucking I don't know I, I, idea of some fucking romantic notion of a writer from a '30s movie. Like I'll check into a hotel for a week and I won't talk to you. You did that. I'll just write my masterpiece. You know, I'll write my thing, and that's how that you know that's what I'll do. And I did that once. I checked into a hotel to write a script, and I was like, "Are you out of your fucking was mind?" Was that a Family Guy script? No, it was before Family Guy. I thought, you, I thought you did that. I thought you went to the Beverly Hills Hotel to write a Family Guy script. Oh, no, I never did. But I, I probably told a story about going to the Beverly It was the Bel Air Hotel. Oh, and it was that's quite it. an episode of a, of a long failed show. But I, and I wasn't going in. Like, for a few days, I thought, oh, I'll do this. And it will creatively charge me. I'll just focus on it. And it was a nightmare. Right. And I thought, and I was like, because I used to think, certain things have to be in place so I can be creative and I can write like my favorite shit thing, you know, the, the lucky pen, the fucking thing, the, all that <laughs> bullshit. Uh, no quiet, no dogs can bark, nobody can ring the doorbell, I need my space and then I can write. Yeah. And that was the worst and I thought, oh, like this can't happen. And then I just kind of went home and I'm like, and I'm spending money for this. So I went home and I wrote, but I fortunately like shortly after that, I had to write a script for whatever reason while I had to be on a plane. I had only two days to write it. I had to fly to New York, fly back, and I had to write it. And I thought, oh, how am I going to do this? I have to write it in the airport, on the plane, in my hotel room, at a fucking... And then, and I did it. And it was yeah. fine. And I was like, oh, I, I can write anywhere. You're putting shit on top of this. Yeah. You're making it harder for yourself. You're right. putting a fake elements on it. Like these things have to be in place, you know, because I have this idea that like, then you'll be better or that's what writers are like. I write now, you could plunk me anywhere. I could sit on the airport floor with my computer. And if you told me you have two hours and you have to write this scene, I'd be like, sure. Okay, I have, I have to do it. I have to do it. I can shut out. I wrote my whole series vicious in a Starbucks. Like I just sat in the Starbucks because I had so much writing to do. I needed to be in a place where I couldn't procrastinate. I'm like, if I'm sitting in a Starbucks all day, I'm either fucking working or I'm a lunatic, you know? So right. I, I just like, I could put myself anywhere. And that was a real release for me when I also stopped telling myself this fake story of the things that I don't believe in writer's block. I, I either have never had it or I've always had it. Well, you, you just know? said you looked at a blank page all day today, Carrie. Yeah, exactly. But it's like, but I write, but I, I'll, I won't stop the day without writing. So it's a little bit of like what you're saying about the three pages. It's just everybody has a different version of it. Right. But I, I will, I will right. the, write. Yeah, the, the, the three pages is, is more of a, uh, that's more of a mind clearing thing. It's not even a writing something thing. You know what yeah. I'm saying? It's getting the shit out and then you can concentrate and, I don't think I ever did it for more than two weeks, but um, so uh, somebody was asking here, just kind of switching gears, and this thing's going to cut us off at the top of the hour, um, which 
you know, Gary, you, you only wanted to go for a little while and this is turned into- I didn't into think I like, have enough a, to say, Mike. I know, I know. Craig, Craig was afraid <laughs> yesterday too. He's like, seven minutes, right? And I'm like, Yes, well, Sarah, Sarah goes good. to Starbucks when she has a lot of work to do. It's, Starbucks can be very calming. There's no waiter there. Nobody yeah. asks you to leave. As long as you don't have to go to the bathroom. Very Family Guy voices. Yes, usually when there is a snippy gay guy on Family Guy. Yes. <laughs> yeah, a, yes, a bitchy gay guy. Um, so somebody asked a minute ago, I saw scroll up, um, any advice on getting into the industry, you know? So I think it's do your thing. I think it's make your, you know, write your scripts, find a way to get them to an agent. Do you go through the writer's guild to do that? Or what, what do you, how do you, uh, you go can, about that? Actually, I think you can go. Get, get an agent's assistant to read something. Anyone that works at a, a decent agency is, is hungry because they're looking for their clients that they're going to build their career on. Yeah, um, that's for writing. I think the same is true for directing. Obviously, you got to make stuff for acting. You got to make stuff. Just yeah. just make it. You got phones, you got computers. Just yeah, now you can. It. And it's easier actually to find out, you know, you can Google anything and find out who gets how to get something to somebody. Don't say no, either. Don't take no for an answer. That was a good thing that I had as yeah. a thing. I always had that as a young person, too. I didn't I kind of like once I clicked into the right thing. I, right. I don't take no for an answer. I'm, I'm very persistent. Um, and I recognize that in other people. And I, you know, the people that have been more persistent with me and more specific, like, like, we have kind of reapproached me or something to read something in a way that I just felt like, okay, you put yourself out there. You're really kind of like, you're really, all right, yeah. you know, like you remember the, yeah. those people. Yeah, like, I know. You can't be shy and coy, like, oh, you know, this, so I don't want to, you know, you just have to be like, you know, don't be an asshole, but you just be, you can't take no, don't take no for an answer. Don't take no for an answer. And it, yeah, and, and if people are good, if, you, if you're good at what you do, people are going to notice. And, you know, there are people I, I know in my brain right now who are trying to get a job who I know are good and are going to get writing jobs and I'll hire them if, you know, I've got something coming up, you know, like I, it's out there and it's the same we were talking about casting last week and if you audition and you're not right for whatever the people are going to remember you if you're good you know it's just you you have to go you have to you have to fail a bunch of times yeah um you know if, if you're lucky you'll fail a bunch of times because by the time you hit it you'll be ready to hit it there's so many young people that hit it right off the bat and they become disasters and, and yeah i know time you know, get, get caught up in everything people see themselves That's on a billboard and you know, and then they're back unemployed two years later, you know, and when you're older, if you see yourself on a billboard, which I have not, I've seen my characters on a billboard, but you, That's you know that somebody else is going to be on the billboard next week. So you can't take it all too seriously. You just have no. to, you, you, you can't be in it for the reward. It's for just the, you know, for going. Yeah. Home. Yeah. It should be the only just thing you can do. Enjoying the process. Completely. Yeah, man. Well, uh, I, I guess we can we can wind down here, Gary. Um, it, great catching up with you. Thanks, and, um, Mike. You know, I'll um, I'll be back out. You know, I'm in Virginia now, and I'll I'll be back out whenever this thing's over. And I have some projects cooking, and it sounds like um, what is, what is the name of of your animated show? What is it called? The Prince. The Prince. Okay. Yeah. And uh, that's exciting, man. Thanks, um, Mike. That's that's very cool. So yeah, man, this was a great conversation. I'm gonna plug your book one more time because uh, this guy is for real. It's hilarious. It's authentic. It's again, it's three dimensional. It's almost like, you know, my mind gets a little trippy sometimes, but it's almost like you're swimming underwater. Look in, in something you're finding something in the ocean that is coral. And then all of a sudden, it's all these fish swimming. You know, it's like it's very there are a lot of unexpected things and it is just grounded by your great honesty and humanity. So, you know, do you mind if thanks. I cancel by Gary Genetics? So thanks, Mike. Yeah, bud. All right. Well, well thanks for having me on. Yeah. I appreciate you doing this. And um, whoever is not following Gary is just not with it. And uh, so please jump on and, and follow this guy. And, you know, just real quick tomorrow night, I have Patrick Warburton joining me and um, how many funny, roles as he played i know i love him he's just a super nice guy and again jay he's lee great guy who has has worked his butt off to be where he is on i know Friday. and then i think i'm just gonna keep doing these every week night through april and then just see what happens but it's it's something this is fun for me you know this is that 
coronavirus lockdown, shit, what am I going to do? You know, like it's, <laughs> I started putting on wigs and doing funny face swap things. And then I just sort of, my, my friend asked me to do one of these. I'm like, hey, man, I'm going to steal your idea. So, yeah, why not? Um, yeah, so it's, again, I think it's a great time for people to just fucking figure out what they want to do and and, I agree. and start doing it. Put that fear away because, you know, we're very yeah, reminded agree. right now how fragile it all is. So Totally, totally. Um, all right, Gary. All right, Mike. Much love Good to you, seeing brother. You. We'll see you, you too. Real all right, soon. I'll see you soon. All right. Thanks for having me. Take care. Thanks, Gary. Bye.